Well, good morning. Welcome to church today. Thank you so much for being out and being faithful to God's house. If you're joining us today for the first time or maybe the first time in a while, I see some regular folks. This is the week of Thanksgiving. School is out. Many are traveling. I also want to welcome all those uh, watching online and joining us this morning. And uh, if you're watching online, of course, you can visit us, those here and online, by going to our church website, uh, freedomkeystone.com, and I know many of you have already availed yourself of that. Well, this being the week before Thanksgiving, our scripture reading today is from Psalm 118, Psalm 118. So if you take your Bibles and you would turn with us, we're going to go ahead and read this morning, Psalm 118. Pastor Sam and Miss Debbie are up in North Carolina just this weekend, be back tomorrow visiting some family and friends. So I'm reading the scripture today. Let's all stand together. Psalm 118, we're going to read verses 1 through 4 and verses 22 through 24. I'll read verse 1, you read verse 2, and we'll do that so forth. Psalm 118, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. Verse 22, the stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. All together on this final verse. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Dear Lord, this morning we thank you so much for this time of Thanksgiving. Lord, thank you that we have made it this far this year with all that's going on, Lord, in our world, in our nation, in our state, and in our families. Lord, we are so blessed. We have so much to be thankful for. So, Lord, this morning, remind us of your blessings. Lord, help us to remember, as the psalmist said, that your mercy endures forever. And, Lord, because of that, your love, your grace, your loving kindness, your patience, your long-suffering, all of these great things that you have toward us, your children, Lord, you love us so much. Lord, help us to be thankful, and not just to be thankful um, because we have to, but Lord, because we want to be thankful on purpose. We want to see the blessings and the things you've done for us. Now, Lord, I pray that you'd bless those that aren't here today. Be with them as they travel, those that are sick, Lord, those around um, our church family. Uh, Lord, we just pray that wherever they are, whatever they're going through, Lord, at home or here in the church, that, Lord, most of all, you would get the glory, and, Lord, with our lives, you would get the praise because you are worthy. And it's in Christ's name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Pastor Chris. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. O God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. 
Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth thy own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand beside great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. So I'll give thanks, give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for us. And now let the weak say, I am strong. And let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what? the Lord has done. Sing that again now. I give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for us. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what? the Lord has done for us. Give thanks.
Well, if you have your church bulletins, just a couple of announcements. Tonight, we have a special evening of Thanksgiving worship and testimonies. There are several folks in the church. We're going to have special songs, and you'll have an opportunity to give some testimonies. Traditionally, on this night, we have had our annual Thanksgiving bonfire and fellowship. We smoke about seven, eight turkeys and uh, have a bunch of fixings and all that. We have foregone that this year, of course, and uh, we encourage you to come back tonight and enjoy some special singing, and I'll give a brief Bible challenge. Also, this Wednesday, there's no midweek service. There's no uh, Wednesday morning Bible study. There's no Awana. Uh, there's no youth group. And this Saturday, Lord willing, the teenagers have a youth activity at the Mobley's home. This is one they scheduled originally back in, uh, I believe, September and has been bumped several times. So this Saturday, and you can look in the uh, bulletin for that, and in the foyer, there's a sign-up sheet for teenagers, and there are permission slips. So make sure that you grab one of those. And tomorrow, and I don't see them today, Ron and Phoebe, I think they're, oh, you, new spot. Okay, you're over here. Um, tomorrow is 56 years. And since we didn't get to say it to y'all last week, since y'all were away, I hope y'all had a great trip. Uh, Mr. DeWitt and Miss Helen, they had an anniversary this week as well, this past week. And we just want to say thank you for that and glad that you're back. They went to the Ark Encounter, went to Tennessee, went all over creation, enjoyed the Creation Museum uh, as well. So happy anniversary to y'all. And... I am Job, lying helpless, suffering loss but not hopeless. I am David, crying mercy, Lord, on me. I am Elijah in a cave, dreading the light of day. I am Daniel, humbly bowed, faithfully. I am Paul, in a prison, lifting praises to heaven. I am John, cast out but not down. I am Moses, seeking shelter in the cleft of the rock. Here I am, Lord, hide me again. I finally made it to the cleft of the rock, and I am glad. For I could no longer stand Many times I will struggle To reach that old rock But he will hide me again and again Safe from the stranger, safe from the danger that would try to do me great harm. I am wrapped up and warm in the love of my master. I am resting. While I lean on his arm So I'll stay a little longer Until I am stronger When all of my healing is done The ravens will feed me and his hand will keep me and hide me till I 
I can go on. I finally made it to the cleft of the rock, and I am glad, for I could no longer. Struggle to reach that old rock, but he will hide me again and again. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows. A dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of His love, and He will hide me again and again. That's a great song. I haven't heard that in some time. Thank you so much. Every time he gets up to sing, I th again, and he gives testimony about it. I still remember when they took him back for the surgery. Is that four years ago? Five years ago. And looked like hope was lost. They didn't know up at the Mayo Clinic. We were there when you came out and shouting. And here's the Lord's goodness, and what a great song that is. What a blessing. Many of us have that same testimony of how God has delivered us time and time again. Psalm 118 this morning. Psalm 118. I think it's appropriate. And uh, JR, uh, sorry, Brother Bobby, I'm going to try to do this here. I got you right there. Called you JR. Vicki, it's good to see you this morning. Did you escape Virginia? Do they know you're out of the state? They do, okay. Well, if we see the blue lights coming, we, we'll, uh, you can go hide in the choir room. It'll be fine. It's good to see you this morning. And uh, as you came in, I thought about the many years right here down front where you interpreted for the death, and thank you so much. And uh, you and your husband, we're thankful for your family. And I guess welcome home for a little bit, I guess they say. Oh, you're moving in or moved? Okay, well, very good. Okay, I know they've done a soft opening with that. Well, that's wonderful. Well, welcome home for a few months, six months that is. It's a great blessing to see you and many others here. I just want to give a quick update about my, my parents and just a, a brief note. Uh, some of you who are on our email list, you know about uh, what I sent out last Monday. My parents, my mom, my dad, and my sister all tested positive for the virus um, in their church in Greenville. And um, I don't, I don't have the exact number, but there are scores of them in their church and in surrounding churches. Um, and some of you know of some even in our area, and of course our area struggled with that. Um, and it's been, we've been very fortunate. The Lord has been so good. Um, and we have, other than meeting on Sunday and Wednesday without food, some of you have coffee, but even without those basic things that we used to do, Almost on a weekly basis, getting together, um, we, as a church, organized, have pretty much cut that out. We haven't kind of met together in those ways. We, we don't shake hands. We're the unfriendliest church in town. We don't shake hands. We're not hugging. Um, our ushers have an offering plate at the door. And, and, you know, I'm thankful because many of you, you've just said, you know, thank you for just being vigilant, and we have been as vigilant as we can be, and we just want to remind you that, you know, obviously um, functioning and going through 2020, we're all in this together. We're all having to learn, uh, but we're, we're trying to do our best, and as many of you have been praying for my folks and many that you even know in other churches and surrounding areas, uh, we just want to be thankful to God for what he has done and pray for those who have been affected, but also as a church family to let you know that we're doing our dead level best. I, I had a few visits this week and uh, just reminded those that um, haven't been out to church that 
If any time you want to come and you feel like you need to wear a mask or you want to do that, pretty much everyone stays separate. I know the camera doesn't kind of show that. People sit in their, their groups and some have chosen to stay home and many, uh, you know, depending on the week. But uh, we're doing our, our best to honor the Lord and to honor you as our church family as we move forward with this. So just continue to keep them in prayer if you would. But as we come to this Thanksgiving week, I thought this would be an appropriate message just for one week to step aside from our study um, in Jeremiah. We've been going through Jeremiah since the summer, and we're going to be looking at 2020. Um, not long, because we, we don't want to look too long at it, but at this particular Psalm 118, simply entitled, This is the Day and These are My Blessings. Maybe when you look at 2020, you're, you find it hard or you can't find any blessings at all. Maybe you have to look and dig very deeply. But there's a verse in Psalm 118. You find it. We read it this morning, verse 24. If you want to turn there, Psalm 118. In Psalm 118, verse 24, this is not our only text. We're going to look through this psalm and talk about it. But it says, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So this is the day, and these are my blessings. You know, every day it's right for Christians to declare or assert or affirm or just to speak it out that this is the day because it's a day to thank God for His grace to us even if we don't see it. God is good to us, and as we look around at our world, our families, our church, our nation, and what many are dealing with. We know our own hearts. Some days it's just hard to get up and say, you know what, I'm finding the blessing. It's hard to rejoice, as the psalmist says. It's 2020. Let's just kind of go down the list here. Perhaps it's worry about the virus, the lockdowns, the national unrest, the ongoing presidential election, the uncertainty about the future, the uncertainty of our finances or our family or their health. Maybe it's the stress of being so busy and all the pressures in life. Maybe it's not enough as going good at the moment in your life and you feel that you can't really say that this is the day and I'm rejoicing in it with your whole heart. Maybe you're struggling with your own anxiety and your own insecurities. Maybe your thoughts keep you up at night and you're not able to get any peace or rest. Maybe you can sleep, but you just can't get any rest. Maybe these thoughts swarm around you, as we'll see the psalmist is like bees. You're trying to just fight off all these things on many different fronts. You feel cornered on every side and no way out. And it seems like things will never, ever change. They say that, uh, was it South Korea? It was one of the Asian countries that the COVID virus, the death, the, the death from suicide has been greater than the death from the virus. And not only the mental health, as we've heard, but people who have emotionally, physically, psychologically have, have suffered under this and not being able to get out, to be with family, to be with loved ones. And some feel like, wow, it's never going to change. We sometimes say it's just been one of those days. You ever had one of those days? It's been one of those weeks. It's been one of those months. I guess we could say it's been one of those years. Maybe you just don't feel like being happy about this day that the Lord has made, but this particular psalm, Psalm 118, and this verse in particular is true. Even if we don't feel like it or experience the exact opposite of it. So whenever we see a verse like this in the Bible, we want to ask ourselves, what did the psalmist write? Why did he write this verse? What did he see? What made him write down such a remarkable thought? And as we look at the psalm, I want you to think about it through his eyes, from his perspective. What is he looking at? Who is he looking at? You're going to see this morning that the psalmist, as he writes Psalm 118, he's not looking at himself. He sees his circumstances. He is very well aware of what he's dealing with and what he's going through. He feels trapped. He writes it out. I'm trapped. I'm in distress. I'm anguished. There's a lot of pain. I'm fighting enemies on all front. It's frustrating. It's painful. I'm crying out to you, Lord. But ultimately, it's not about him, it's about the Lord. He's talking to the Lord in all of this. He's looking to God. He sees what the Lord has done, is still doing, and will do for him, how he rescued him. And ultimately, that his mercy, it starts out, his mercy endures forever. He begins and ends this psalm with the same verse, with the same thought. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endures forever. 
It's not enough for us just to put our feet on the floor after we get out of the bed in the morning and just if we think about it to say thank you, Lord, for this day or just to trip over things as we try to find our way to the coffee pot or to get out the door, just to think about the day the Lord has made. Here's the psalmist saying on purpose, Lord, you've made this day. I will rejoice. I will think about what you have done, what is about to happen, what is going on in my life, and I will thank you for it. You know, Ms. Kay this morning mentioned prayer for her daughter-in-law's uh, father who just was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Some of you have had to deal with the loss of a loved one or they're going through treatment. Some of you even sitting at home, I know as I've visited with you, you're dealing with cancer. Some of you, it's other things. You've lost a job or there's some issues in life. Well, praising God does not mean that you ignore or close your eyes to or are ignorant of all the things you're dealing with, marital issues, uh, issues in the home, with your grades, with your finances, with your health, with your family. It just means that, God, these things are beyond my control. I can't seem to get a handle on them, but, Lord, I'm going to praise you anyways. And, Lord, I know that you are in control even though everything is spinning so fast. One other interesting note about Psalm 118 before we read is that it's pretty much the dead center of the Bible. So when you open your Bible to Psalm 118. This isn't the message, but when you open it up, it's the dead center of the Bible. Some numerologists and others who have done more study on this than I, they count verses 8 and 9 in Psalm 118 as the two center verses in the Bible. It's kind of interesting. We're going to read those in a minute. And it's sandwiched in between Psalm 117, the shortest chapter in the Bible, and Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible. Again, not the reason we're looking at it. Also, Psalm 118, no one really knows who wrote the psalm. Most people attribute it to King David. You can see that in the book of Ezra. They kind of talk about King David, and they sing this psalm at the founding of the second temple, and then they attribute it to David. But we don't know exactly who wrote it. It's most likely David's psalm, but it's also a psalm of Jesus. This is the last psalm, Psalm 118, to be quoted in the New Testament. In fact, it's quoted many times in the New Testament. It's a part of the psalm, Psalm 118, that the crowd sang on Palm Sunday. You remember when Jesus came riding in on the donkey? They took their jackets off. They threw palm branches down. They were singing this psalm. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were throwing their jackets and their palm branches down, proclaiming Jesus to be the king. That's found in Matthew chapter 21. It's also the last of the Hallel Psalms, which is what we get for Hallelujah, of which they were six, starting in Psalm 113 to Psalm 118, that are read on Passover night. These festivals, they would go through these Psalms, and they all focused on the deliverance of God's people from bondage. So when Jesus and his disciples set for the Last Supper, the Passover, they sang this Psalm that we're going to read this morning. And in fact, before the meal, they would sing Psalm 113 and Psalm 114. And after the meal was over, Psalm 115 to Psalm 118. And this is the very last psalm. In fact, it says in Matthew 26, verse 30, that after they had the last supper or the Passover meal, they sang a hymn and they went out to the Mount of Olives. What were they singing? They were singing Psalm 118. So when we read this this morning, it has a lot of significance. And in fact, the writer is very prophetic because he's not only talking about his circumstances, what he's going through right now, and how he's coping with it, but he's also prophetically speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus was the King, the Messiah. And it's one that is speaking of what he will go through. And in fact, in context, dealing with this is the day, it was the very day that he would go to the cross. So the day that is before us might be one of the hardest days of our lives. It might be the most difficult thing we've ever faced. But this is the day the Lord has made. We can, we will, we must, we should rejoice and be glad. And that means to find joy in the things. This is the day. These are my blessings. And in a day right now where so many things have been taken away, we have friends in Connecticut that just this weekend, their governor said no more youth sports. 
all youth sports on the high school level, and they have, are contemplating the, co uh, the collegiate level, it's over. No more high school sports. No more youth sports at all. Uh, we just have to cancel them. In some other states, they've canceled school. And we've seen this throughout this year in a year where things have been taken away or things have been lost. We can't recover them. We can't go back and undo this. It's been tough to say this is the day and can I even find the blessings? Well, when we read this psalm, we see that it's, it's a psalm of declaration. It begins the same way it ends, that this is the day the Lord has made. His mercy endures forever. God's mercy will never end, and it applies to each one of His children. It's used 34 times, this phrase, His mercy endures forever. And it's a statement of fact and gratitude, noting that God's mercy his loving kindness, His grace, His love will never be taken away from us. And that we should always give thanks to Him because He is always good. This is what we often say, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. We say that, God is so good. I was doing some research on this song. It's an African song, God is so good. And I tried to come up with the origin. Who wrote this? Where did it come from? 1960, a missionary uh, in the African dialect in Swahili, he translated it in 1970 and brought it to the United States of America. But they had been singing this song for many generations. God is so good. He's so good to me. I love him so. He answers prayer, whatever it might be. God is so good, not if I feel like it. And there are days that we absolutely, unequivocally do not feel like it. Some of you this week, you've experienced that. Some of you had plans this week with family coming from out of state, and they can't come from the state they were to come from. Some of you have shared those stories, and it's heartbreaking. It's gut-wrenching to know that this was supposed to be a time in a year of mess where we could have a little joy, a little happiness. So let's look at this psalm together, Psalm 118. That's my lengthy introduction I'm going to give you some points here that just say why we can give thanks, why we can see the good, why we can say this is the day and these are my blessings. Note verses 1 through 4. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for He is good because His mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that His mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that His mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that His mercy endureth forever. So can I say, first of all, number one, we can give thanks to God because He's good and His mercy will never end. It's very simple to think about. He says in these four verses, it's four different groups of people, and he's kind of narrowing it down. He says, you can give thanks to the Lord because His mercy endureth forever. He is good. You and I, we need to, this morning, I don't know, have you done that yet today? Have you given thanks for the little things, for shoes that you're wearing this morning? Going to the mission field, many of you see the pictures, maybe even in watching the news, you look at other countries, but our missionaries send these reports back, and some of us have been on the field to see it. We're kids. Children are tying uh, plastic bottles with strings to their feet for shoes or things that they can find out of the garbage dump just for clothing or many places around our world just don't have the many blessings that you and I have. Have you given thanks to God this morning for the basic necessities? Have you thanked God this morning just for the ability, the opportunity, the blessing of being born in the United States of America, for being in this nation, even though it's chaotic right now? We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to think about it. We're afraid to turn the TV and the radio on because it's still constant. But you and I, we are blessed to live here. It is a great nation because of God, not because of a politician, not because of what they do or don't do in Washington, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. This is a great nation. We should give thanks to God because he is good. So here the writer is saying, congregation, he's calling on them, first four verses, say to God that he is good. Give thanks to God. And I'm telling you this morning, you need to say thank you. We need to say thank you. You ever, when your kids were little, you're taking them over to someone's house and you, you have to remind them before they go? Now listen, you need to say thank you. Uh, make sure you appreciate when you eat everything on your plate. 
You say, thank you. You stay there till it's gone. You say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. You say, thank you. You do that. And then you get there, and then it all falls apart very quickly. Ah, it's like, oh, they, take, they don't take after me. They take, you know, you're just trying. Sometimes we're like that as, as children of God. We just forget to say thank you. But thank you says it best. Before we say thank you to others, if we are ungrateful, it's coming out of an ungrateful heart where we have failed to recognize the blessings of God. He says in verses 1 through 4, we give thanks to God because He's good. God is good no matter what we face, no matter what we're going through, and His mercy endures forever. I like how Spurgeon put this. There's reason enough to give God thanks. Goodness is His essence and nature, and He is always to be praised whether we receive anything from Him or not. Those who only praise God because He does them good should rise to a higher note and give thanks to Him just because He's good. You woke up this morning, didn't you? Can I get an amen? Did you wake up with pain? Can I get an oh me? Yeah, some of you. We, you woke up this morning, hallelujah. You walked out of the door. Someone brought you to church. You're sitting here. You're enjoying life. You can hear. You can see. You can taste. You can touch. You can live. You and I, we need to give thanks. Have you just thanked God for that? There are many that can't be and are not here today because they're, of their inability to get out their health or they just... One reason or another can't be in church. Do we thank God for the blessing of life? Number two, not only can we give thanks to God because He's good, number two, we can shout or give a testimony because He's our help and He hears our prayer. And I'm going to ask you to shout this morning, but the word here is give a testimony. Sometimes we fail to say something to someone because we're embarrassed. We are shy. Maybe we're a little too proud. And then we fail to say it, and then that person is gone. We talked about this in our Sunday school class. We fail to say thanks. We fail to give a testimony. We fail to say thank you until it's too late. I can't tell you how many times I've done a funeral. People weeping at the casket right here down front over tears that should have been shed years prior, over words that should have been spoken while the person they loved was living. And they failed to do so because they thought they had plenty of time. They failed to give a testimony, to give a shout, to say, thank you. Look at verses 5 through 7. He says, I called upon the Lord in my distress. That word is anguish. I'm going through it. The Lord answered me. He set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. So he's describing what he's going through. He's saying, it is tough. This is the day. These are my blessings. And I am dealing with some problems. This word anguish describes someone who's being tortured in some way. Physically, mentally, emotionally. Someone who's going through a painful experience. Have you experienced painful things this year? Yes, we all have. Maybe not even this year. Maybe just in your life in general. You've lost someone close to you. You just feel like you're always behind the eight ball. There's, you just feel like, I can't, I can't catch a break. Here's the writer saying, I'm calling upon you in my distress, my anguish. Lord, I don't understand. Will you help me? But note, he is calling on the Lord. He's in distress, but the Lord is the one. Note here, verse 5, he answers me. He takes the rider and he moves him to a large place or to a place of safety. You know, when God's got your back, you have nothing to worry about. The Lord's in control. So we can give thanks to God because he's good, but we can shout for joy because he's our help and he hears our prayer. Look at number three, number three. Look at verse number eight, nine. These are the two middle verses in the entire Bible, they say. We trust in the Lord because he'll never let us down. Look at these verses. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. I don't know about you, but do you have a lot of trust in politicians? Do you have a lot of trust in people who are higher up, so to speak, elected office? Do you have a lot of trust in maybe you've been let down by a boss, you've been let down by a parent, you've been let down by a coach, by a teacher, by someone, by a preacher. You've been let down by a lot of people. But these verses say he will never let you down. No matter what we're going through this year, He will never let you down. You can trust Him because He will never let you down. 
It's better to trust in him than to put your confidence in something that is going to ultimately collapse. And one day, someone that you look up to will disappoint you. We've all been disappointed. Parents are disappointed by their kids. Kids are disappointed by their parents. Parishioners are disappointed by their pastor and vice versa. Same with presidents and politicians. We are all disappointed. But we will never be let down by the Lord. You and I, we can always trust him. The question is, have we got up this morning and said, Lord, it's still 2020. I've heard many people say this morning, I can't believe that we're almost at Thanksgiving. We went through March. March was six months long. I don't know if you remember that. It was long. I didn't think we were going to get out of that month alone. And yeah, it, it's coming quickly, but at the same time, have we failed to see the goodness of God in the darkest of days? God is good all the time. And it, even if we don't see it and we don't experience it, it doesn't mean that just above those clouds that are dark, there shines a brighter day. And this is not just cliche. This is the word of God. Here's a man going through distress, and he says, God, I trust you. I put my confidence in you because you have never let me down. And by the way, he never will. He never will. Number four, Look at these verses, 10 through 16. We'll look at verses 10 through 12 first. We can sing and we can fight because he is our song and he is our strength. You say, how can I sing and fight? I'm sure you've seen some of the musicals. You know, in fact, they're trying to remake a lot of these musicals these days, and some of them are good, some of them are not so good. But here's the idea of the, the picture of the psalmist here. He's singing and he's fighting. And imagine this here. Look at verse 10 through 12. All nations can pass me about. I'm surrounded. But in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They can pass me. They surrounded me. Yea, can pass me about. But in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They can pass me or they surrounded me about like bees. It's kind of strange. He goes from nations and then to people to bees. And they are quenched as the fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. He's getting specific here. He said, I am surrounded. I've been through war. I'm fighting for my life, and I'm struggling to survive. It seems hopeless. But, Lord, I can sing and I can fight because you are my song and you are my strength. And he likens this here to a swarm of bees. Now, when I was, my friend and I, Scott and Stephen and I, we, we served at our local Christian camp in the hills of Virginia. And we were 11th graders, and so we weren't counselors. We were just kind of the grunts. So they sent us out with weed whackers or lawnmowers, and we went up the hills there in Virginia. And Scott and I were going down by the creek bed, and every Thursday, the kids went home on Friday. Every Thursday, you'd go up in the afternoon to the mountain, and they'd have watermelon. You'd have uh, all the fixings, and uh, it was a great time. But we had to go and cut the trail. We had to, you know, weed whack. I remember Scott and I going uh, down the trail, and, of course, you know, we're juniors in high school. We're goofing off, but we're going down there trying to clear the path, and, we see this log right there in the way, and we go over and try to move it, and we can't do it. And then, you know, we're, we finally get it moved over, and then we start we whacking, and we hear a noise. It's loud. And it's, uh, then we see an image, and it's almost like the cartoons. I still remember vividly. And it, they were buzzing, and then this black speck or this large zzz, And we could hear it, and then we just, like, dropped the weed whackers and... We went, and Scott passed me. He had some, and he had like two in his shirt, one, one in his pants. He got stung all over. I got stung. These were, I don't know, they were these killer whatever wasps. At least we thought they were. We got back. Scott was allergic, and they had to take him to the hospital. I remember he swelled up. I almost died. We didn't know that he was allergic to it, but here's David or the psalmist saying, I'm being swarmed. I'm fighting off all of these things, and I can't seem to win. Lord, I'm in anguish. I'm fighting for my life. But Lord, you are my strength and you are my song. And while I'm fighting, I have a song in my heart. I don't know what you're facing, what you're going through, but as David is fighting, there's something right here. You know, this morning I got up and I had a song and I had to find it and I, I put it on, on my playlist as I drove into church today and it just encouraged me. I don't know about you, but the world has some good songs. There are some good songs out there, but they're not the songs that are going to feed your soul. Doing research for this, I, I thought, you know, 
what are songs about a day or the day? And some of you maybe remember the song, and I asked my kids, and they looked at me like, what are you talking about? I can see clearly now. The rains are gone. It's going to be a bride. So I did some research on that song, and, I, and you know, I'm always trying to find songs that have some deeper meaning, something in there. There was nothing, but it, it's a nice little song. There's been variations of it. As 1972, that song came out, and it was a hit, number one, in the U.S., the U.K., and around the world. A great song, but when you listen to the lyrics and you read the words of that song and the meaning, it's, you know, it's a, it's a heartfelt song. It's one that obviously was written of someone who went through some tough times. And I can finally see clearly now. There's some great songs in the world, but not songs that will feed your soul when you're fighting for your life. That's why we see great is thy faithfulness. That's why we see how great thou art. That's why we know that as we fight the battle, God is with us. Let me encourage you. Find a song that speaks to your heart as you fight that battle, as you go through that valley, and let that feed your soul. Quickly, number five. Look at verses 13 through 16. Not only can we have strength in a song as we fight, but number five, we can move forward and not fall because we look back and remember the strength of the Lord. Here David is looking back, verses 13 through 16. He says, Thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord help me. The Lord is my strength and my song, my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. The right hand was huge in the Old Testament in those days. Most people, that was their dominant hand. They could fight and to say, the Lord was my right hand. He will strengthen me. He will help me get these things accomplished, whether it's to fight or to work or to whatever it needs to be done. And here he's saying, Lord, you are my strength, my song, and I can rejoice. You will help me. You will lift me up. Someone put it this way. Good songs, good promises, good proverbs, good doctrines are none the worse for age. What was sung just after the passage of the Red Sea is here sung by the psalmist and shall be sung to the end of the world by the saints of the Most High. You know, what song is on your heart? And Again, there are a lot of songs out there. I mean, now with iTunes, we, we have that subscription. You can find any song that you want at any time that you want it. There are millions of songs. But what song, truly, when you're going through the darkest of night, speaks to your heart and encourages your soul, that causes you to look back on the faithfulness of a God who said, I will never let you down. I am always good, and I'll always stand by your side. That's what we need to hear. And sometimes it doesn't even come from the best voice. You don't have to have a good voice to sing the Lord. He knows your heart. He knows what you're going through. He understands your pain, and he sees your hurt. Quickly, number six, we can live with purpose because God has a plan for my life. Look at verses 17 and 18. Here's the psalmist saying, I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. By the way, that's for you and me today. Your purpose, if you don't know what God has for your life, you need to find out what God wants you to do. It doesn't mean that you have to be a preacher, a missionary. It, 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 perhaps God has something even greater for you that you haven't discovered yet, but you need to get in God's Word, and you need to find that out and say, God, what do you want me to do? Ultimately, this verse says, I will not die, but I will live, and as I live, I'm going to declare your works. I'm going to tell people what you've done. And giving a testimony is simply that. It's not getting up and preaching. It's just sharing. You know what? This is who I used to be. This is what I used to do. This is where I used to go. This is how I used to live. But the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. There's been a great change since I've been born again. He says here, we will declare the works of the Lord. I will not die but live. We mentioned this last week. William Cowper, who wrote, There is a fountain filled with blood. This was his favorite verse in the Bible. Martin Luther had this verse inscribed on the study of his wall. John Wycliffe cited this verse from his sickbed when his enemies surrounded him. He, that's from John Wycliffe's translation that we get the King James. John Wycliffe cited this verse when the enemies around him and urged him to confess his sin of, of heresy from his dying bed. I like this one here, a World War I fighter pilot. His name was Donald Gray Barnhouse. When he was asked about whether he was afraid to fly in the open biplanes, he responded with this verse, verse number 17. And he rephrased it like this, 
Ours is not to fly and die. Ours is to live and testify. You know, you don't know. We don't know what today's going to hold. We don't know what this week is going to hold. We don't know if 2020 is just on repeat and someone forgot to change the dial and it's just going to go right back into it. But we have a job to do. God has a plan for your life. You have a purpose. You're just not here by chance. We can live with purpose because God has a plan for my life. Quickly, number seven, we're almost done here. We are worthy. We are worthy because he covered us with his righteousness. Look at verses 19 and 20. This is a great verse. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. By the way, let's just parenthetically put this to the side. Jesus said there are two ways. There's the narrow way and there's the broad way. There's one that leads to life everlasting, and there's one that leads to destruction. The question is this morning, which road are you on? If you are on the broad road or the broad way, you are depending on yourself, what you can do and what you have done to get you entrance into heaven. The gates of righteousness will be closed to you at the end of this life. You will not find entrance. St. Peter will not meet you there, and you, the Bible says, will die in your sins without Christ. But if you know the Lord, it is because He is worthy. And because He is worthy, He makes us worthy. And the Bible says He clothes us in His righteousness. It's not anything good that I've done. When you look at my life, when we look at the lives of others, there is nothing good about us. Nothing. We're hideous. We're awful. We're ugly in our own sin. But the Bible says that Christ has clothed us in his righteousness. And this verse here says, verse 19, open to me the gate of righteousness. It's so interesting that as Jesus, think of it in the book of Matthew and the Gospels, the gates were open as Jesus came riding in on the donkey and they were laying down their jackets and the palm branches. Hosanna, save now the king of Israel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Open to me the gates of righteousness. Have you been saved? Are you depending on what you can do or what someone else has done for you, which is Jesus Christ? I like this quote here. There are multitudes who don't care whether the gates of God's house are opened or not. Although they know that they are open wide, they never care to enter. Neither does the thought of praising God so much as cross their minds. But the time will come for them when they will find the gates of heaven shut against them. For those gates are the gates of righteousness through which there shall by no means enter anything in that defileth. That was Spurgeon. You know, with COVID, a lot of churches are empty. And many Christians, sadly, haven't missed a beat because church is optional. The gathering of God's people, the congregation of the righteous. I'm not here to preach a message to you who are here or to those even watching at home, but just to say that We're worthy because we're covered in His righteousness. And righteous people are forgiven people, and we gather to give glory to God, not because, hey, look at us. Look at my education. Look at my income. Look at my family name. Look at what I've done. No, we get together and say, it's all about Jesus. We lift Him up, and we are worthy because He is worthy. He is exalted. Number eight, quickly, look at verses 21 and on. We are accepted Because he was rejected. I will praise thee, thou hast heard me, art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused or rejected is the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The cornerstone. Where have you heard that? Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the one that holds it together. No text in the Old Testament is quoted more in the New Testament than this. Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. You take him out, it collapses. You leave him in, it supports us all. See, the head of the church is Jesus, not me, not you, not any entity, not denominational heads. Jesus is the head. He is the cornerstone. But he is the stone that was rejected. We are accepted because he was rejected. Think about that for a second. The psalmist is thinking right now. He he doesn't fully understand or realize that the Messiah would give his own life for his people. He doesn't fully understand that, but he's saying here, we are accepted because he was rejected. 
Let me just give you one verse here from the New Testament, Romans chapter 9. Speaking of the cornerstone has become a stumbling block. Romans 9 verses 32 and 33 talks about those who are ashamed of the cornerstone and they've stumbled over it. Jesus, why would I trust in Jesus? His name is nothing more to many in our nation and our world than a curse word. He's a laughing stock. He's ridiculed, mocked, rejected. Please, don't give me that. He also said in 1 Corinthians 1.23, we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews, he's a stumbling block. People trip over just this cornerstone that was rejected. But he was rejected, by the way, we are accepted. We have another way of putting it. He took my punishment. He took your punishment. He took our place. So he says, this is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. God's plan was that he would be rejected and that we would be accepted. Imagine that. My sin kept me from God, but his sacrifice brought me close. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. It's true in a general sense, but in particular, it's speaking about the sacrifice of the one who would be rejected. This is the day. Passover night, the Last Supper, they're singing the song, and Jesus knew in his mind, this is the day I'm about to be betrayed. I'm going to be crucified. I will be mocked, rejected, and left alone. But this is the day the Lord has made. Quickly, number nine, we were set free, but our sins bound him to the cross. We see this in verse 25 to 28. Save now, or Hosanna, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord which showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. This word translated save now or save us is Hosanna. This is what they're crying. He was bound to the cross, but we were set free. Has anyone ever done something so special for you that there's no way you could humanly repay them? I mean, in your lifetime, what they've given you, maybe you could accrue some money and you could hand it, but what they gave you was you couldn't put a price tag on it. What Christ has given us has an eternal weight of glory. He gave his own life. He shed his own blood. He was bound to the cross. We were set free. We were able to go free. Because of what he did for us, the sacrifice is willingly given and it's fulfilled in a way that the psalmist probably never expected. And finally, we end the same way we began. We can give thanks to God because he's good. His mercy will never end. Look at verse 29. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. The psalm began with enthusiastic praise and it ends the same way, recognizing once again the goodness of God at the end of it all. If we start with praising God for his goodness, we're in a much better position to end with praise despite all we go through. In the mid-1950s, there was a man named Jim Hill in the town of Portsmouth, Ohio. He was a new Christian, graduate of a business college, and he worked as a sales rep at a shoe company. Jim's mother-in-law, who was then only 50 years old, had just suffered a debilitating stroke. And as he drove home from work one evening, he had her on his mind. He was thinking about Revelation 21, verse 4, which describes a day when God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There'll be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. As he's driving, the words, this new Christian, Jim, he began to get the words to a song and it's flooding through his mind. He didn't have anything to write on. As soon as he pulled in his driveway, he opened the door and he spotted a piece of cardboard on the ground. He picked it up, immediately began writing these words. He wrote down the first words of the song. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear. The first line to the classic hymn, what a day that will be. He wasn't sure it was any good, but he and his wife and sister-in-law went and sang it for his mother-in-law. She was the first person to hear it, and her face immediately brightened with a smile. Now, 65 years ago, 
Today, this song is sung in churches around the world, and it's even a standard in many hymn books. There's really no other song quite like it. Nobody sang it like Mr. Jim Hill. He passed away in 2018, by the way, at the age of 87 in Middletown, Ohio. In fact, this song is one, whenever we got together at Thanksgiving, Christmas, before we all left, we'd get together with Papa and Grandma's kids, and they'd sing the song. We'd sing the song. We sang it at Papa's funeral, his home-going service, at Grandma's funeral. And it's a song that's meant a lot. And as I thought about this is the day, I thought about there is coming a day. There is coming a day when we will look back, and although maybe you can't find something to rejoice about, but we can look ahead. So there is coming a day when there's going to be no more heartaches, there's going to be no more pain, there's going to be no more sorrow. But if you don't know the Lord today, you can't say that. If the worst that you think you have to go through is dealing with the shutdowns and COVID and all the issues in our nation, the Bible says there's something far worse than that for those who don't know Christ, who haven't been forgiven. But the Bible says that God loves you so much that you and I, we are sinners, that we need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to call on him because he will hear us. We can confess our sin to the Lord. You don't confess it to a man, to a, to a leader, to someone else. You confess it to God. God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I need salvation. Lord, I trust you. You can do that today. And if you don't know the Lord today, why not today? I want us to end this morning just singing the song a cappella. You don't need the words. Many of you know the words. I know the Lord has moved in some of your hearts because you're going through this year just like I am. And this passage, this psalm, has kept me up some nights just thinking about it. This is the day the Lord has made. This is the day. Can you say that on purpose? Lord, thank you for today. Not just because it's Thanksgiving week, but because God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day, that will be. Sing it out now. What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day! Glorious day that will be. Let's sing that second verse. There'll be no sorrows there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, and no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. One more time on the chorus, sing it your best. What a day that will be when my Jesus and I look upon his face. One who saved me by his grace. Dear Lord, just help us. Thank you, Lord, for just being so good. Forgive us for just complaining so much.
and all, all that we deal with. Lord, we look forward to that day of there's going to be no more parting, no more division, no more issues, and no more time. But Lord, we'll be with you. What a day that will be. So Lord, help us to say it on purpose. This is the day. Thank you for what you've done in my heart this week as a result of the study of this psalm. Lord, encourage me, encourage my family, encourage each and every parent, young person who is dealing with issues, separation of loved ones, the loss of life or income, health, whatever it may be. Whatever situation we find ourselves in, Lord, help us to be glad and rejoice in it because we're not alone. You are with us. And one day we'll hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Lord, we pray that you bless your word, bless your people. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.